Hi everyone, welcome to the fifth person's live webinar. Uh, my name is Rusmin. First and foremost, a very happy Chinese New Year to all of you. And I hope over the last one week, you have a great celebrations uh, like I did. Okay, so um, today we're going to uh, discuss on this particular topic called Building Passive Income with uh, REITs. Okay, but before I go into the uh, topic, I uh, just want to make sure that everyone can see me and hear my voice loud and clear. And uh, if you do, uh, please let me know in the comment box in front of the screen. Okay, so it looks like you guys can see me. Thanks, John, Kenny, and the rest uh, for replying this uh, request. Okay, so I'm just gonna share with you uh, my screen. Okay, so let me know if you can see my screen. Okay, I'm just gonna switch off myself. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Yep, okay, sure. All right, cool. Um, okay, so this uh, live webinar, the usual way that we conduct is usually through uh, Q&A. So this is what's gonna happen. I'm gonna briefly share with you uh, what's tonight's topic, basically uh, REITs, uh, how you can actually build passive income using uh, investing in REITs. And uh, if you have any questions along the way, you can just ask them and I'll be uh, try to answer all of them, okay? so. Um, but for this webinar to work, you have to ask questions. If not, we're going to end this very, very early. Okay, so uh, first, I'm just going to share with you a little bit more about this uh, building passive income with feet. Okay, so usual disclaimer applies. Uh, what we're going to share with you tonight is only for educational purposes. Okay, I'm going to bring up some of the listed uh, REITs and companies uh, listed in Singapore, Malaysia. Okay, so if you happen to buy those stocks, it's your own decisions. Uh, and I'm just going to share with you from my experience. Okay, so I'm only here to learn uh, from us. Okay, so just a couple of days ago, uh, we received an email from Max. Uh, Max basically asking us whether can he treat REITs as an annuity like investment vehicle whereby if the REITs dividend yield is 6%, uh, he basically can get 60000 a year if he has a $1 million portfolio. Okay, so he emailed us this question. Of course, uh, some of you will already know the answer is yes, because REITs you, uh, if you are looking at 5%, 7%, or 10%, is basically what you see is what you get, okay? So, uh, and he also asked, uh, can REITs uh, beat the inflations, and does it have a long-term capital appreciation? Okay, so of course the answer is also yes, which I'm going to share with you a little bit more, some of the findings that I had uh, over the last uh, 10, 20 years or uh, since those IPO, REITs IPO, okay? So he also has a few questions regarding the, what are the drawbacks and precautions that one need to manage, okay? So uh, with this question, I just want to go and kickstart this webinar. And if you do, please uh, let me know in the comment chat box so that I can see them and I'll try to answer all of them, okay? So uh, first and foremost, can REITs really be a uh, investment where we build passive income upon it and something that we can rely on be it good time or bad time. Uh, if you just look at this uh, table here, which I actually wrote a year ago in 2017, I actually com compute a list of uh, REITs that have a listing history of more than 10 years. So you can see here you have Ascenders, which actually listed in 2002, and you have Capital Land More Trust, which listed in 2002. Okay, so this is the first REITs in Singapore that is ever listed, then followed by Ascenders, Fortune and so on and so forth. Okay, so they, today we have close to uh, 39 REITs, and uh, six of them are business trust. Uh, but this table basically showing you that if you were to invest in those REITs since IPO, okay, these are your results if you hold it until 31st January of 2017. Okay, so this is as of last year. Okay, so if you were to invest in Ascenders REITs, you can see that your total return uh, is 384% if you include all the dividends that you have uh, received over the years of uh, listing, okay? And if you were to compound it, it's about 11% compounded annualized uh, growth rate, okay? So this is pretty impressive for REITs, which are, most people think that REITs are usually uh, old man stocks where they don't really have growth. But in fact, REITs 
actually does provide some capital appreciation also. Okay, so what this means is that if you have 10,000 invested in SNS REIT since IPO until now, you have, have received a total uh, net profit, including the dividends of uh, 38 thousand dollars okay so this is just from the total return okay so of course this is one of the best reads they have the good return uh, and along the way down you get to see the return gets uh, lower and lower but generally oh, all these uh, 19 reads they have shown you here uh, almost seven of them 17 of them or rather uh, 16 or 15 of them actually have uh, produced a uh, positive uh, return okay so reads itself if you trace back throughout the history, they have actually give us a very stable and a consistent and dividends over the past uh, 10 to 20 years. Okay, so it is one of the instruments which I love. Uh, but for those of you who do not know what REITs is, I just want to give you a quick explanation. Basically, REITs is a real estate investment trust. It's a collective investment scheme that allows uh, people like us to invest in uh, commercial assets like shopping malls, uh, hospitals, and uh, offices and sometimes even industrial buildings okay so uh, this reads basically allow us to invest so if you for example if you were to invest in capital land mall trust they have uh, 19 shopping malls in singapore basically you are, have exposure to all these nice things shopping malls okay so you don't really have to come up with a lot of capital okay and uh, throughout the past 5 to 15 years which i studied uh, most of these reads actually give up a uh, quarterly dividends uh, whether it be a good time or bad time, they still continue to pay dividends, okay? And one reason why REITs are so resilient is mainly because they are property, okay? So just like you invest in a residential property, but commercial properties are actually much more resilient. So let me give you examples. Uh, if you are talking about uh, healthcare REITs like Parkway Life REIT, uh, Parkway Life REIT basically they have uh, tenants or hospital like uh, Parkway, hospital, Glen Eagle hospitals. Okay, some of these properties which is leased out to these hospitals operators, it can be a very long list tenure of their 15 years. Okay, so this 15 years, uh, basically they have uh, locked in the tenants and the tenants has agreed to pay the rent uh, every year. And these tenants also agreed to pay incremental uh, rent of uh, C according to the CPI index. So basically every year they can increase the rent uh, according to the inflation rate. Okay, so it is very, very stable. And likewise for malls, uh, like shopping malls, uh, let's look at, for example, Plaza Singapura or Vivo City. Uh, even during the crisis, uh, we still go to shopping malls. Okay, and most of the tenants in the shopping malls still continue to make money whether during the crisis or not. Okay, so, uh, but they are, on the other end, there are REITs, they are actually more volatile. Uh, REITs are like office REITs, like Capital Land Commercial Trust. You know, their rent can fluctuate uh, up and down, okay, depending on the economic cycles, okay. But these REITs generally still continue to pay uh, stable dividends, except that you can expect uh, in certain years the yield may be higher and in some years may be lower, okay. So there is some volatility in that, but basically they are not your typical companies like shipping where, you know, in certain years they can make losses and they stop paying uh, dividends, okay. So REITs are not like that, okay. So Having said that, uh, there are some reads that still screw up, as you can see from the table here. There are reads like you know, Lipomo, which did not perform relatively well. And the same for alcohol commercial reads, uh, and which has been uh, changed over to uh, Fraser Commercial Trust because the previous managers of alcohol reads have actually screwed up on uh, managing this read. And you can see the return. Uh, if you were to invest in them since IPO, you have actually lost almost half of the value. Okay, so. Uh, back to the questions where Max asking, what are the drawbacks and uh, precaution investing in some REITs in Singapore? Of course, the answer is that some REITs, you know, they may have uh, bad managers. Okay, so these bad managers may tend to decide on how to run the REITs based on their own interests. Okay, so when I say their own interests, basically, I'm referring to their management fees, you know, where they were just focusing on acquiring more and more properties so that the assets under management under the REITs will grow. So when the risk assets under the REITs grow, the management fees paid to them will be even much higher. Okay, so because of that, there is sometimes there's a misalignment of interest where risk manager can become uh, self-interested. Okay, so these are some of the risks which you can actually learn. And a lot of time they also uh, borrowed too much money from the bank. And uh, this is one way we can look at uh, 
REITs is that you need to check their given ratio. Okay, so basically you don't want to invest in any REITs that have overly leverage. Okay, so you can see from this, uh, two REITs like Elko and Mercator Industrial REITs, they are one of the two of the victims which were in trouble during the subprime uh, crisis. And there's one more which is not in the table, which is the Sizen REITs. Uh, Sizen REITs has been uh, divested, all the assets in 2016. So I'm not going to talk about them uh, here. But generally, most of the reads actually have uh, performed relatively well. Okay, so I have the data uh, as of 31st January 2018, which I will show you uh, later. Okay, so basically, uh, reads are really an instrument or investment, which if you are looking to build passive income, it is something that you definitely have to consider. In fact, I have uh, reads in my portfolio, and I also built uh, the reads portfolio for my auntie because uh, she relies a lot on dividends, so I only invest in her portfolio, mainly in the dividends, uh, mainly in the REITs itself. Okay, so um, of course, uh, how to look at REITs, of course, you need to look at uh, you know, REITs that own prime properties. They are located in the good locations. They must have a good tenants. And uh, the occupancy for those uh, properties has to be very high, or if not very stable over the last uh, five years. The best is 10 years. And you also have to look for risk managers who are aligned with your interests. Basically, they focus a lot on uh, growing your distribution per unit or net asset per unit, okay? And uh, financially, the risk must be also conservatively geared, okay? So today's, uh, most REITs are actually conservatively geared, uh, which I will show you later, most of the gearing uh, 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 across the uh, Singapore REITs here, okay? But here, basically, uh, you need to also, the last thing that you need to check about REITs before you invest is, of course, the valuation. You don't want to overpay for a REIT, you know, and it got into the wrong cycle and you lose your money. Okay, so um, this is something which I can just really share it with you here. Of course, we have everything laid down here in dividend machines uh, on a step-by-step -step basis. And this is going to, we're going to relaunch these dividend machines on the, in three days time, okay, so basically uh, this coming Monday, for those of you who have not joined the machine, you can definitely consider looking into one because we actually break down the entire system of how to analyze REITs and not only just REITs, but also other income stocks which you can actually build a very steady and consistent stream of passive uh, income. Okay, so uh, some of you who have already joined dividend machines or have been investing in the REITs market will also want to know or find out how the recent Singapore uh, budget 2018 affect uh, REITs in Singapore. Okay, so basically one of the main points which were actually brought up during the budget uh, is that the SREITs ETF will soon uh, enjoy the tax transparency starting from second half of uh, 2018. Okay, meaning to say that in the second half of uh, 2018, REITs ETF like uh, uh, Philip SGX, but currently there are three of them. Okay, Lion Philip SREITs and Nico AM REITs they will enjoy the tax benefit like you know, retail investors is enjoying now. Okay, so basically, uh, currently these three ETF are paying government tax on a corporate level, 17%, for the dividends that they receive payout by the REITs itself. Okay, so REIT ETF is basically a pool of uh, money that investors pull together, and then uh, the managers of the ETF will then uh, deploy and buy uh, many different types of REITs across different regions and then and then put them into one portfolio where investor can just buy into the ETF and that will give them exposures to uh, many type, different types of REITs like commercial, uh, retail, hospitality, or even healthcare, okay? And it can be across different regions. Uh, basically, there are three of them here. So you have uh, SGX, APEC, Dividends, and Lion, and also Nico AM, okay? So, but basically with this Singapore uh, Budget 2018 announcement, uh, the REIT CTF uh, certainly going to benefit from this uh, tax uh, transparency, meaning to say that the dividend they receive, they no longer have to pay uh, tax back to the government. Okay, so the one that's going to benefit the most among the three is going to be Lion Philip S Street ETF. Okay, so uh, I just want to go through all of them with you. The first one is the APEC REIT ETF. And I've written this before, uh, when the first launch this REIT ETF, I wasn't actually. I was very excited with REITs ETF because it is something which we can uh, uh, buy, and then uh, they're gonna give us a very stable uh, dividend yield. But what I found out later was that there there is actually a management fees of uh, running this ETF about 0.65 percent a year. Okay, so and also on top of that, they still have to pay corporate tax, 
that they receive. So by the end of the day, when you invest in the ETF, the yield that you're gonna get, you're gonna have to spend about one to two percent difference. Okay, meaning to say that if you were to invest in uh, uh, a REIT that's giving you six percent, if you buy through REIT ETF, you're probably gonna get five percent or four point eight percent. Okay, and because of this, too much cost involved. But with this Singapore budget, of course, uh, they can manage some saving. And this SGX APEC REIT ETF is going to have benefit thirty percent of it. It's gonna benefit of uh, seventeen percent of uh, tax saving okay from starting from second half of this year but it's not very significant if you look at the uh, nico am the reit ctf uh, the exposure in singapore market is actually is much higher okay so this reit etf is definitely going to benefit more uh, and of course the one that is going to benefit the most is the lion philip ctf where their entire exchange traded funds uh, invested in Singapore REITs. Okay, so this REIT ETF is going to benefit from this Singapore budget and it's definitely going to give us a better yield. Okay, so if you are considering looking into a REIT ETF, uh, of course you can consider this uh, Lion Philip S REIT ETF because I think in terms of efficiency, they are probably going to be the best among the three. Okay, so uh, apart from the REIT ETF, okay, REIT ETF is basically the lazy way of uh, investing in REITs. It straight away give you a uh, good exposure and a uh, diversification uh, risk. It actually reduce those risks. And uh, if if some of the risks that issue rights or they have strict dividends, you don't have to worry because if you invest through risk ETF, there will be someone there helping you to manage all this. If you were to craft out your own risk invest those risks individually by yourself, you need to uh, do this kind of paperwork, which I think is not. A, significant it doesn't cost me a lot of work usually it's like once a year i just need to fill up some forms and then i send it back um generally i still like to build my own reach because it's very very easy to read to build our own reach itself okay unless you uh you have no idea about what reach is all about and you still want to participate from the high yield that is paid out by the distribution by the reach in singapore you can actually invest through uh, lion philip as etf okay so uh, this is a lazy method. I usually go through my own uh, uh, list of uh, reads that, and then I will just build up from there. It is better in terms of you. And uh, I think the next questions most of you will have uh, is that uh, the interest rate high. Okay, so Federal Reserve has been uh, increasing the rate over the last two years. As you can see from the charts in front of you, uh, we have uh, since 2000, the interest rate, I plotted out uh, all the way Till now, okay. So you can see in two thousand and two, there is there was the first REITs that got listed: Capital Land, More Trust, and then followed by Ascenders, Fortune, and then today we have got thirty of our REITs in Singapore. Okay, so uh, based on this uh, interest rate chart, I just want to share with you how REITs have gone through the time where the interest rate was actually gone up to as high as uh, more than five percent. Okay, so during those period, uh, you can see. Uh, when the capital land more trust and SNA reach just got uh, started, they were a store in a period where the interest rate were relatively low, okay, about 1.5% to 2%. Okay, as they got listed you know, and more risk coming along, uh, interest rates started to spike, which what we are experiencing now. Okay, so a lot of times people say that you know, when interest rate goes up, the REITs will pay lesser dividends because of the borrowings that they have in their book, okay, and they have to pay higher interest rate. Well, that makes some sense, but that is based on theory, okay? But on actual or practical uh, investment world, if you go back and trace those uh, performance the, over the past uh, period, basically from 2000, those streets have listed and gone through the interest rate. Is it true that those streets actually pay lower dividends, okay? The answer is not true, okay? Those streets actually pay higher distributions per unit over the, during this period. Okay, so let me share with you some of the uh, data that I have. Uh, I've got this from an analyst report, I think uh, from Philip. Okay, so they have actually compiled a very good uh, return for Singapore REITs over the past uh, 13 years. Okay, so you can see here uh, the, the return for REITs in 2003 when, when the interest rate were relatively low is about 35%. And 2004 is 31%. And when the interest rate started to increase, the they also continue to uh, benefit from the from the share price uh, appreciation. And the reason is because the dividend have grown during those 
uh, period. Only until the subprime crisis hit, the REIT prices started to collapse. Okay, so the REIT prices collapsed in 2007 and 2008 were mainly caused by the subprime crisis, not so much on the interest rate. Okay, in fact, when the interest rate was increasing at the point of time in 2004 and 2005 and 2006, here, okay, REITs were relatively doing very, very well. Okay, only when the subprime hits, then the share price actually started to plunge. Okay, so you can see that uh, in 2009, the REITs started to recover again, but we are safe to say that in, when the interest rate rates start to increase, uh, REITs does not necessarily uh, have to lose money. They doesn't necessarily have to be paying lower distribution yield. In fact, when the times are good, like in the 05, 06, or 07, uh, they can actually increase the rent because when economy is doing well, more and more people are actually making more money. Okay, so when they make more money, as a landlord, REITs can actually uh, charge higher rent per square foot. Okay, and because of that, the tenants will have to pay and they are willing to pay also because they are racking up good profit for their company or the shops that they have. And because of that, you know, we can see the rent actually has gone up and the revenue and net property income for most of the REITs have actually gone up as well. Okay, so uh, RSI REITs during this period have actually been able to pay a higher distribution yield uh, or dividends uh, distribution per unit, despite the fact that interest rate has goes up. Okay, so I, did, I just want to debunk this myth that interest rate goes up means it's bad for the REIT. It is true to a certain extent, but we need to look at a case by case uh, basis. Okay, so uh, this chart basically show you the rent uh, over the past uh, 18 years, uh, 16 years. Okay, so uh, now we go back to this uh, interest rate. Now we are actually in the period where interest rate started to go up. And at this stage, the interest rate is about 1.5, 1.3% based on Federal Reserve. And uh, based on the news that I read just a few months ago, uh, Federal Reserve were actually planning to increase the rate to about two to 3%, depending on the economic situation. Okay, so it is not confirmed, no one knows whether they're gonna increase until 3%, but uh, our take here is that, you know, if you are investing in REITs, you just have to make sure that you invest in REITs, they have a relatively low gearing. So in the event where interest rate were to spike back up to 5%, you know the REITs that you invested are generally safe, okay? And they have a large percentage of their borrowings are fixed, okay? So over the next three to five years, that's the best. So even over the next two to three years, if the interest rate were to hide to 10%, this REIT does not necessarily be uh, affected significantly. In fact, they have to wait for their loans to mature and then they will renegotiate the, the loan rate with the bank, okay? so. Uh, be prepared, okay? So rather than uh, trying to react, okay, interest go up, I have to sell my REITs. It's not true, okay? So um, this is the latest uh, table that I have for all the REITs here in Singapore as of 31st January. So you can see that the prices are up to date and you can see the return for Ascender, CDL, Parkway have actually have an annualized return of uh, 10%, 11%, 10%. So it's pretty amazing. Okay? They look at the result, it's pretty good. So if you look at uh, the table here, most REITs have performed relatively well. Okay, so on the net basis, you have losses. So assuming you have invested in all these REITs, okay, and some of these REITs will issue rights along the way, and you don't subscribe to any of them, you don't sell your uh, new paid rights. Okay, basically you do nothing, but you just wait for your dividends to come in, you don't uh, fork out any capital, and this is going to be a result. Okay, so of course, if you were to take up the rights, some of the rights that is issued by some of these REITs during the crisis or when they want to buy uh, properties, then uh, your return will definitely be much, much better. Okay, so this is just for uh, Singapore uh, REITs. I have uh, late data for the uh, Malaysia REITs as well. So you can see the Malaysian uh, REITs uh, have performed relatively well. If you look at the Axis suites, have actually uh, as of thirty first January twenty eighteen has compounded a annualized return of ten percent, eight percent, seven percent, six percent. Um, it's pretty well, pretty good uh, results, and none of the REITs have actually lost money. Okay, so Malaysian REITs have done even better as compared to Singapore. Of course, Singapore have more REITs, so there will definitely be some uh, REITs that have gone haywire. Okay, so you can see some of the REITs here like Amphastreets, their capital gain has actually negative 34, 
but a lot of the return actually come from the distributions okay so that's why REITs pay out very very handsome dividends and uh, if you take into account of those dividends actually you're still making a profit from this uh, in first read okay of course your return is not going to be fantastic but just the fixed uh, deposit rate of uh, malaysia so you must as well put into the fixed deposit okay but generally some of these top three top five are pretty good uh, reads of course these are just past performance you can't just based on this past performance and then assume that these reads are good okay you need to analyze them on the case by case basis all right i also have this uh, data which recently uh, i just compiled and I look at the performance of uh, Hong Kong REITs and you can see Hong Kong REITs are also doing relatively well. And the most impressive one is actually Link REITs, which owns uh, retail space in Hong Kong and also some of the car park space. Uh, and the sponsor is actually Hong Kong government. So it's a very, very strong uh, REITs that are very good at uh, doing the asset enhancement initiative. Okay, they, they know how to value add to their properties. And you look at the performance of today, is. 700 over percent meaning to say that these reads have actually returned uh, seven times okay so if you were to invest ten thousand in this link read you have a pocket a net profit of around seventy five thousand. okay so this is very very impressive uh, it's the best reads i think i've seen in asia link read and then followed by sunlight which is about 9.5 percent well, it's pretty nice. So these reads have also done very, very well. Okay, so reads, uh, I don't think anyone can argue that reads are a bad investment where it is a vehicle for the sponsor to dump a lousy asset. This is not true. Okay, so those are just myth where people just naturally don't like reads. They just lamp it, but they don't look at the overall context. I think reads are a very good vehicle, you know, if you want to build a very steady uh, dividends okay so you can see from return here so these are true data which I actually compile i take a long time to compile this okay so uh use it all right okay so um i hope uh, you guys are asking questions uh let me take a look some of the qu uh, questions before i move on to the next segment okay okay let me show you uh, my face first okay and okay i have uh, some questions that are coming up okay let me try to uh, track them if you have questions please type in the comments so i can actually answer them okay so okay my screen a bit small i just try to pull up those questions Okay, so um, how should we ensure that our investment capital is protected while enjoying the annual dividends that is paid out by the REITs? Okay, so um, how can we ensure that our investment capital is protected while enjoying annual dividends uh, from the REITs? Okay, first, you must only invest the amount that you can afford uh, to lose. Okay, so when you can invest the amount that you afford to lose, you are detaching yourself emotionally. Okay, so meaning to say whatever happened to that investment, you are not going to affect that emotionally. Okay, because recently I have uh, received a uh, few emails and from the same person. And uh, this is a person where every time there's a crisis like Brexit, uh, every time the market, there's a dip. Recently the market also, earlier this year, the market actually has corrected a bit. Uh, and he was panicked and he sold away all his uh, REIT investment. Okay, so I was actually very worried for this person because I told him that you should not panic whenever there is a dip. You should be buying instead of uh, selling. Okay, and uh, I also know his background. I think uh, I don't want to disclose who he is, but basically he's in a critical stage where it's not physically fit to actually invest. So emotionally, he's worried about his uh, investment uh, Nasa. Also, anything happened to his that portfolio, he's constantly worried. That's why when market, there's a sudden jerk, he will panic and sell everything. Okay, so the rule of thumb in investing is of always uh, invest the money that you can afford to lose. Okay, so you don't have to worry, you know, whether market go up or down, you know that you're going to receive those reads and those dividends, uh, you don't have to worry. Okay, so, um, and the second thing is, of course, make sure that we invest in REITs that have uh, good uh, properties. 
They are run by good risk managers who actually focus a lot on how to improve uh, your distribution per unit rather than the total uh, asset under management. A lot of times, some of the reads which I analyze, they like to say that you know, their total asset have uh, compounded at an annualized return of 20-30% ever since they got IPO. Okay, That is not a very uh, message to the unit holders because what we as a unit holders want is that to see our distribution per unit grow over the years. Okay, If you can't grow that distribution per unit, then uh, I don't consider you as a good risk manager because you are putting your own interest first versus uh, unit holders uh, interest first. Okay, so uh, risk manager is also very important. But of course, you have to look at the uh, risks that are financially uh, geared. Uh, you have to be careful on risks that have uh, high gearing. Uh, generally, I try to have a gearing ratio of uh, less than uh, uh, forty percent. If you Gearing ratio is basically total debt over total assets. Okay, so you don't want to have uh, too much debt in the REITs because a lot of REITs that got into trouble, like uh, uh, MI REITs, Mercator Industrial REITs, or Alco REITs, they got into trouble primarily because they have too much debt at that point of time. Okay, so you want to avoid that. And of course, the fourth thing is that uh, you don't want to overpay for those REITs. Make sure that you buy uh, those REITs at uh, attractive valuations. Uh, how do we know that the valuations are attractive is of course when one indication that I always use to make sure that the yield are at a historical high yield. Okay, so historical high yield could be during the subprime crisis or euro debt crisis or China market bubble crisis. Uh, and those were the period where you can tell that the REITs are trading at the highest uh, dividend yield. And those were the best time to actually invest in REITs. And likewise, if you want to sell the same thing, you want to see when the REITs have the lowest distribution yield over the five, 10 years. And that's the time where if you want to sell, you can consider selling. If not, you can keep and take the dividends. Okay, so those are the four main things which we always uh, share with our members. You know, if you are dividend machine members, you're probably already aware. And this is one way that you can actually protect your downside. Of course, uh, from the portfolio level, you need to uh, diversify your REITs into different sectors. It could be uh, retail, healthcare, and then you've got uh, industrial, okay? And try not to put all your portfolio, everything with REITs, okay? <laughs> because that is not a very good diversification because REITs itself are still sensitive to the interest rate. I'm just afraid the interest rate one day may spike to 10%. We'll never know, okay? Uh, Asian financial crisis have shown us interest rate could go up to as high as 12%, 15%, and it may happen again. So you want to be prepared for that, okay? So generally, I try not to, have my REITs investment portfolio more than 50% of my portfolio. Okay, so diversify them. And, and that's how you actually protect your downside, okay? Okay, some of you ask, would you buy CMT, CCT, manual life REITs now if you have enough cash? I'm not gonna answer that because it can be very dangerous if uh, I give you stock tips like that and you do not know. And some of the audience who are listening here may not be uh, aware some of the list reads, uh, what they own, what kind of properties that they own. Okay, so it can be very dangerous. I'm sorry, Daniel. Okay, Cecilia. Hi, Cecilia. Um, I would like to ask at the time being, the market is very volatile and the global interest rate is going up. Do you think it's the right timing to go in now? Okay, so these questions, I just want to share with you uh, these slides, which is, I'm going to cover actually. Okay, back to the screen here. Um, okay, so now we are back here. And okay, so Cecilia asks, is now is it now a good time to invest in REITs? And of course, uh, to answer that question, usually I look at the valuation of the REITs generally across the uh, all the REITs here in Singapore. And the most uh, useful valuation metrics for REITs is usually price to book ratio. And this is a ratio that I use very frequently when I look at the uh, uh, REITs as a whole. Okay, so this is the price to book ratio of the REITs since 2002. So this is only like make capital, lemo, trust, and then you have ascenders. And then today we have a combination of uh, all the REITs and the valuations. Okay, so, uh, but basically you can see that over the different period, REITs uh, price to book ratio have gone up, have come down, depending on the economic situation. Okay, so if you were to put a uh, median or the average uh, price to book ratio is about 1.05, and this will give us a very good guidelines 
whether is it a good time to invest in wheat. Okay, so if you were to ask me now, okay, um, okay, just to go back in history first, you can see that when the time is bad, wheat valuations will go back to the average valuation. Okay, meaning they are neither expensive nor cheap. Basically, they are fairly valued. So when the times are good, the valuation can go up to 1.4 times, basically trading at the 40% pre premium to the book. It can come down again during the SARS, uh, and then it will go up, back up during the uh, uh, bull run in 2006 and 2007, okay? And when the subprime hits, you can see the valuations dip all the way down to 0.5 and 0.4, okay? And this is, of course, the best time to invest in wheat if at the point of time you have the guts to invest, okay? Because things are pretty bad then, a lot of uh, stocks that you invest will probably drop by 50%, and uh, many people cannot survive that kind of situations. And I hope you should see this as an opportunity because if you were to invest aggressively during this period here, 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 well, over the long term, you still perform relatively well. You don't have to exactly buy at the bottom, okay? But this is on the high side, of course, and the market has since recovered and the risk again, once again, trade at the premium to the book, I again, come back down during the subprime crisis. And this is exactly the first time which I enter into the REITs market. I invested in uh, Lipomo Trust back then and it's Capital Land Commercial Trust. And I hold it for, I think, one to two years. And I actually exited at a very good premium, uh, good capital gain of uh, 30 to 40%, including the dividends about uh, 10 to 20%. Okay, so, um, that, but I've since divested those uh, two REITs. But basically what my point here is that if the REITs uh, valuations, when it's trading at the below the average book value as a whole, Okay, it is a very good time to enter rich market, okay? And when it got back to the premium, to the uh, price, average price to book ratio of 1.05, you can consider selling, okay? If not, you can continue holding it and receive uh, steady dividends, okay? So for me, I usually sell, okay? And then I'll buy back again when there's a dip, okay? So 2013, again, uh, there was dip and we started to buy back, buy some of the reads that like part way. And again, it can it went back up again, uh, and then the China market crash. The valuation again for all the REITs in Singapore have come back down. And it was very attractive. Then we started to buy even more REITs at the point of time. Okay, so today uh, valuation has come back up again. It was trading at the premium, and then earlier of twenty eighteen, uh, well, we have seen this news: stock plunge erased all the gains in twenty eighteen, and Dow Jones have actually have lost thousand over points okay so this is one of the bigger news that affected earlier this year and uh, because of that risk has pulled back okay quite significantly but again it is still trading at a fair valuation so if you ask me uh, there are some opportunity in the risk market in singapore some are trading at an attractive valuation you can look at them but um, most of them are not cheap okay but there are a few of them that are cheap opportunity okay so we are neither in the expensive region or very expensive, very, very cheap uh, valuation where we can actually go in and uh, shop that more. Okay, so at this stage, if you can find opportunity in which market, you can definitely buy, but you want to leave uh, enough cash, you know, when this thing happens again. Okay, so you take opportunity during the dip. Okay, this is what I usually do for myself. And of course, uh, those three that we invested, then until now we are still holding and we are sitting on a good uh, capital gain and also the dividends that we have collected over the past. Uh, three years. Okay, so this is how I look at the REITs in Singapore and currently the valuation is uh, fairly valued. So there are good opportunities around. Okay, you just have to find them. Uh, you can start to take a look at a Capital Land More Trust. I think the yields are relatively attractive. Again, uh, this is just for my uh, for learning purposes. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. Okay, so um, I also have uh, M REITs price to book ratio in case those of you who are interested in Malaysia REITs or you have Malaysians uh, uh, people, I mean, uh, followers who are actually tuning in, you can actually use this or take a screenshot of this uh, price to book ratio. And I'm just gonna give you an average uh, price to book ratio over the last uh, 18 years. And you can see that uh, Malaysian REITs have ex almost very similar to Singapore REITs, it was trading at the attractive valuations during the Sunpark crisis, and when the market start to recover, they trade at a huge premium, okay? Again, there's always a reversion to the mean. They have to come back to the middle level where it is considered a fair valuation. Once in a while, they'll go back up 
and they come back down again. So this is one of the best periods again to invest in uh, Malaysia REITs. Uh, at this stage, uh, Malaysia REITs are relatively expensive. Uh, there are some REITs that are attractive, okay? Um, you can consider also looking into them. Uh, I Today, I was, I was just looking into this uh, particular REIT called Capital Land Malaysia More Trust. It is the first time in the history that they are trading at the discount to the book ratio. Okay, so if you want to start Malaysia, you can consider looking at that particular REIT. Um, they own some of good properties in Penang, like Gurney Plaza. Okay, if you are if, uh, if you've been to Penang, you know, if you go to the malls, then you can look at it. If not, better stay out. Okay. So uh, but generally most of the REITs in Malaysia are not uh, cheap. Okay, so they are uh, slightly expensive. So uh, you have to look at every single one of them. For Hong Kong REITs, I also did the same uh, exercise. And you can see that uh, Hong Kong REITs actually have uh, reached the fair valuations for the first time in uh, early 2018. Again, it has pulled back down again. It is trading at a slight discount to the book value. Okay, so some Hong Kong REITs are actually trading at a discount. If you want, you can actually consider looking into that. So if you ask me, am I buying into any REITs now? The answer is no, <laughs> okay, because I have got into uh, some of the REITs a uh, few years back, two years ago, two or three years ago at a very good valuation. Okay. Um, well, if you have full of cash, you want to employ slum, you can definitely take a look at some of the REITs that are trading at a very good valuation. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, okay. So, to help you get started, how to find REITs that are trading at attractive valuations, we actually have uh, this REITs data. Uh, which we compile and we update every year on uh, fifthperson.com. I just show you, I just exit this uh, webs, uh, this my PowerPoint slide, and I will just go to the uh, fifth person. All you need to go to do is that go to the fifthperson.com uh, and you can see uh, our website. It's very nicely done. Okay, but that's not the point. Um, you just have to go to reads data where we have uh, compiled the entire REITs that are listed here in Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. And we also calculate uh, for you the dividend yield and the price to book ratio and also the property yield, the valuation of those properties. And those of you who, have, who don't understand property, you've got to go and read up because it's a very important metric and then followed by gearing ratio, which I've been talking about since earlier tonight, uh, this webinar. Okay, so uh, you can see here there are currently 39 REITs, I think. Uh, five of them are business trusts. So you can go through all of them here. Okay, the data are up to date. Uh, prices are updated every day. So you can actually, as and when you want to look at REITs, you can come to this website. It's free of charge. Uh, and the data here, we also update them every year. So as and when ascendant REITs have full year result, we will replace the distribution per unit with the latest figure. Okay, so you make sure this. Uh, sites are uh, very useful for anyone who want to invest in REITs in Singapore. Okay, so you can really rely on this uh, data. Again, this is, there could be a mistake or error. You always have to do your own due diligence. Okay, we do our best to pull out the most accurate data, but at, the, at other times, you know, we may make some mistake here and there. So you just have to make sure. But so far, uh, data are pretty good. Okay, so you can see, uh, okay, this is the zero because they just got listed. So I don't have, we don't have a distribution per unit asset value okay so if you look at the highest view which is lipo mall okay highest doesn't mean good okay there are pros and cons here and but basically you can go through the entire list one by one okay so now this is uh, as of updated uh 8 25 pm okay so which is quite recent and we have malaysia reads uh, in case you're interested in uh, malaysia reads all of the bits are listed here okay we didn't miss out any of them if we do let us know Okay, so this is the, all the REITs that are listed. We have Pavilion and of course Sunway REITs. When I go to Malaysia, Sunway Pyramid is a place which I used to go when I was a tourist then. Okay, uh, yeah, you can go through all of them. Now you can see the yield for Capital Land Malaysia Trust is about 7.2%, okay, uh, which is very high. First time in the history over the they are listing until now, they are trading at the highest distribution yield. And the first time they are trading at discount to the book. Okay, so given ratio is also uh, relatively conservative. So take a look if you are interested. We have Hong Kong also. So just to show you uh, all this. Uh, 
Okay, Hong Kong is the most uh, recent uh, editions that we have. I think we just included this uh, two weeks ago. So it's very, very new. And uh, the results are going to come out soon. We're going to update all of them also. Okay, so the yield we are facing, which has for the highest yield, about 8.6%, which, okay, so, okay, so you can use this to kick off with your uh, REIT analysis. Okay, so back to our slides. Okay, so, okay. Now, I uh, just go back to those questions that I asked. Well, a lot of you have asked so many questions. I don't think I can finish, but I try to go through uh, some of the questions that I have. Okay, so this is specific. So I try. Okay, so uh, Gopeng asks when we look at the REITs financial statements, there are two columns one is a uh, group. The other one is trust uh, account. Okay, so which one should we look at? Um, basically, we usually look at the group account. The trust account are basically the holding uh, entity. So it could be just shell. Okay, so usually you focus on the group itself. Okay. And uh, can you comment on Sabana Reads? Christopher asks, what actually went wrong and how to turn the boat around? Well, uh, this is the this question should be directed to the REITs manager of uh, Savannah, but from my own observations, uh, Savannah REITs, uh, I don't think they own a very good uh, prime properties. I don't think they have a good prime properties in their portfolio. Basically, they own mostly industrial assets. And uh, well, if we go back and look at their performance distribution per unit has uh, come down quite significantly and they have issues, uh, right? And uh, well, I think uh, just look at the performance itself. I'm not sh sure the, there's a good alignment of interest between unit holders and uh, 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 risk managers, okay? And that's why uh, last year we have seen some of the activists trying to kick out the risk manager because they wasn't very happy uh, with the performance. And they were also trying to buy some of the properties at uh, inflated valuations. Uh, well, I won't say inflated, but because those who are valued uh, by independent uh, valuer, okay? Um, but from my experience, you need to, uh, look, to look at the independent valuer valuations carefully, okay? Because uh, when I want to value my own property, I can go ask for a few valuation from the different independent value, okay? And they will come, up, come back to me with different valuations. Of course, if I'm the owner of the property and I want to sell the property, I want to choose the highest, okay? So you have to be very careful when it comes to acquiring uh, this kind of asset. As Savannah happens to get caught on this and uh, some of the properties they would want to acquire, the unit holders actually uh, argue that they were actually inflated or overvalued and they were trying to go against the deal. Okay, in the end, it didn't get through. Uh, now the CEO has stepped down. They're trying to have uh, new units. Okay, it's a very sensitive issue, so I'm not gonna comment that much, but I will not invest in some of the REITs. What are the red flags that we need to be aware? Okay, so there are many red flags. Okay, REITs managers are very important. Make sure they're aligned with you. Uh, Gain ratios, make sure that uh, the REIT does not have a high gearing ratio. Okay, back to this uh, TM. I just want to highlight some of the gearing ratio that is being done by uh, some of the REITs here in Singapore. Okay, uh, those of you who invested in REITs, you may not even aware of this, but it's just my observation, which I find uh, increasingly uh, disappointed. Uh, I won't say disappointed, but it's a way to hide gearing ratio. Okay, I just want to show you maybe some of the live uh, case study now. Okay, I don't have data, but I have to go through the financial. So let's pull up one of the examples. Uh, yes, I read. Okay. So, oh, in case you are wondering what is ESR read, uh, usually the last, the old name of ESR read was actually Cambridge. Um, but I just want to highlight one important point here. And we go to uh, full year results of the reads. And you can see that. Um, go to the balance sheets and go all the way to the uh, gearing ratio, okay? 
Okay, so here we are. Um, okay, so if you look at the uh, balance sheets of ESR REITs, you can see that they have, as of group, uh, you can see the group and trust. Okay, so just focus on the group itself because this is the unit where it capture every properties. Um, the trust could be just the holding uh, invest, holding entity. Okay, so if you look at here, the total assets for ESR REITs of 2017 is about 1.7 billion. Okay, if you look at the borrowings that they have, it's about 155 million and uh, 514, 515 million. Okay, so if you were to go to the uh, presentations of the ESR REITs, uh, they will tell you that the gearing ratio is, okay, leverage. I just uh, happened to see this, but I uh, want to share with you um, how we can use it. Okay, so they have uh, debt to total assets. Okay, so this is the metric that we use to uh, make sure that the REITs does not exceed 40%. Okay, so ESR REITs on the first glance, they passes this criteria. Okay, so it seems like they are conservatively geared, but one thing that I want to share with you here is that if you go back to the balance sheets, okay, if you notice one particular item here, you have perpetual securities uh, holders. Okay, these are actually debt. Okay, it's just that they don't have the uh, 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 lifespan. They don't have a period where the, the REITs have to pay back. And because of that, they are being classified under equity. Okay, and when they classify under equity, uh, the REIT manager do not have to calculate this loan as part of their total loans. Okay, because these are not uh, short term or bank loans. Okay, so if we were to add this, you know, as a conservative, uh, investors you need to add this 151 million back to their total borrowings and this is where you get over 40 percent okay so based on my metrics i will not look at esr reads because they have actually uh, exceeded the current level but of course if you were just looking from uh, you know, surface you may not be able to tell that okay so uh one way that we can help you is of course uh trying to compile this data as accurate as possible uh we have also included this gearing ratio here. So you can see Cambridge, which is the ESR REIT, the gearing ratio is about 48%. Okay, so this, this is our own calculations. Uh, we, don't, we do not have to agree with their gearing ratio. I mean, because we think that those are debt, perpetual securities are debt, and they should be classified under the gearing ratio. Okay, so based on that, I will not look at ESR REITs. All right, so this is something which I think I can share with you. These are red flags. Okay, how do I purchase Lion Philippe Wheat? Uh, Julie asked. Okay, we only have five minutes left. I have so many questions. Oh, there's a lot of questions. Huh? Uh, how do I purchase uh, Lion Philippe Wheat? Uh, you just go to SGX. Uh, you go to call any of the brokers that you have. You tell them you want to buy uh, Lion Philippe Wheat and they will show you and point to you where is it. Okay, uh, why? Taking up rights give better return, Tiffany asks. Okay, why should you subscribe to rights? Okay, so when a REITs want to buy a new property, usually that's the case, they would have to raise money from the unit holders. Okay, uh, because REITs by nature, they pay out 90% of the distributable income. Okay, so they don't have retained earnings, they don't have cash, they don't have a reserve to buy a new property. Okay, because of that, sometimes when they max up their borrowings, they have to raise money from uh, shareholders uh, by issuing rights or placement. Okay, so rights, most of the time, they actually issue at a huge disc discount. And because of the huge discount, if you don't take up the rights, you'll be diluted. Okay, so when you are diluted, your shares in the, uh, as a percentage in the REIT itself will shrink. Okay, and because of that, people are getting more benefit because they get the new share at a huge discount while you actually miss out this opportunity. And because of that, you will lose out a big deal if you don't take up the rights, okay? So when you take up the rights, you are getting the shares, new shares at a huge discount. And if you were to average out these new shares, your actually cost of uh, purchase even lower. Most of the time, is even lower. And that will give you a higher uh, distribution view. Okay, so that's why uh, sometimes it is also best to go for access rights where you take up as many access rights as you can. Of course, this will depend on your portfolio. 
uh, allocations. Okay, so I hope I answer your questions. How do you think, uh, Aaron asked, how do you think the recent boom in the online shopping uh, mall, shop, shop e-commerce will affect uh, mall reads? Um, okay, so e-commerce, it is something which, uh, I think Danny also asked this que same questions. Uh, e-commerce is something that has been uh, very worrying for our retail space, uh, not just in reads, but even for retailers, uh, because they are very disruptive. Uh, even the players like Amazon, Lazada, Redmart. Okay, so these people are trying to uh, disrupt the traditional retail industry. Okay, they have been disrupting, but as a percentage of total uh, retail value or spending, it is still uh, in the single digit. Okay, it's very low, but they are catching up. Okay, so over the next uh, few years, I believe they are going to go up to uh, double digit, the low 10% to 20%, uh, and more and more to come. Okay, so most reads of course they were they felt the pressure i think uh, five years ago and uh, they know that e-commerce are coming and they can't escape the train the train is there they can't escape that so what they did a lot of risk manager did is that they changed their business model uh into a instead of typical malls where you go and buy your necessity nowadays if you go to the malls it's actually a lifestyle okay it's a lifestyle uh, business it's a place where you go out and hang out with the friends you go and watch movie you hang out at starbucks uh, and these are the experiences which you can't get online okay so malls or risk managers know that this is something that e-commerce cannot offer to uh, shoppers okay so that's why they create experience in the malls so even if you go to the vivo city if you go to the top level there's actually a garden uh, with a swimming pool where you can bring your kids down there and actually play with the water or you can paddle. Uh, and sometimes they have exhibitions, they, they actually invite some of the artists over and performance. So all this uh, is something that you can't actually experience it online. Um, and because of that, of course, uh, malls still continue to attract uh, traffic. And I think uh, more streets have actually done relatively well in countering this issue. Uh, so even most today, I don't see there's a big, big problem in terms of disruption because they have navigated uh, quite well. Uh, a lot of the tenants are now F and B, about almost 30% uh, of the tenancy mix. If you look at the capital and more trust uh, portfolio, so you can't eat online. Okay, so you still have to go down and uh, eat and experience. Okay, so when you go down, then they will actually give a boost of uh, spending to their tenants. All right, so this is something that I'm not worrying, but of course it's a trend that we need to uh, measure. So in the US, it is uh, more, I just switched so they can see me uh, here. Okay, so in the US, the trend is actually uh, much uh, stronger because of the different culture. Most of the Western people, they spend their weekend at the beach picnic, while Asians, because the weather is so hot, uh, you want you do not want to go under the sun. Okay, so most of the time, weekend, you know, I go to the shopping malls, okay, nothing to do, I watch movie. And when you walk along the malls, you actually spend money, eat dim sums, eat ramen, okay, so all these kind of things you still have to go. So that's why retail is something which I still believe is still uh, remain resilient and it's remain relevant until today, okay? We still have to monitor that, of course. Um, okay, is, is the ETF listed in SGX? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, okay, this is not relevant to uh, currency risk investing. In, okay, Max asks, oh, Max, I see you here. Thanks uh, for coming back. Max is the one that actually asked me on the email. Uh, currency risk investing in Malaysia. Which if you're Singaporean, I don't think it makes sense to invest in Malaysia REITs because of the currency depreciations. Uh, I personally would not invest in Malaysia REITs if I'm based here in Singapore. But if you are Malaysians, I believe it is better for you to invest in uh, Malaysia REIT because you uh, some of the REITs in Malaysia are pretty good, like Pavilion, Sunway, you know, they have their own IGB REITs, they have their own uh, mixed development where they have their own catchment area. Um, I think those REITs, you, if you invest from there, you don't have cap, uh, currency risk. Where else for overseas investors like Singaporean, like us, you know, there's a, a currency risk. Unless it is very attractive, then I'll look into a Malaysia REITs, okay? So at this stage, I uh, may not uh, look into Malaysia REITs. Malaysian, yes, you should go and look at it. 
Could you show us where is the annual report? Do you find the loans, which I will show you? Um, okay, so, uh, okay, the fixed loans and the floating loans in nature. Okay, you have to go to the uh, financial footnotes under the borrowings. Okay, you go to balance sheet, there's a footnote, so there are bank loans. So you go to the bank loans. From there, you can see whether the loans are fixed or not. And sometimes you can go to the presentation slide of the REITs itself. They will show you, they will tell you whether uh, how many percentage of the loans are fixed, how many, how many of them are actually floating, okay? So generally, I prefer REITs that have uh, fixed uh, borrowings, okay? Well, we have uh, reached almost one hour and there are so many questions. Um, well, thank you, uh, Tiffany, you're welcome, okay? Okay, there are so many questions. I'm trying to answer all of them. Uh, you guys don't mind if uh, we extend this to another five to 10 minutes. Uh, if not, those of you who want to leave, you can leave uh, first. Uh, I'm just going to answer some of them again uh, before I end on this webinar, okay? Remember, this is not going to be the last webinar that we have. We have, uh, every month we have once a uh, live webinar where you can actually tune in and ask us live questions. We have different topics where you can actually ask those regarding those topics. And also we have uh, causes if you are really keen to uh, attend and some of the live workshops that we have, we actually teach you uh, or go into even more in depth on how we analyze reads and what are, the, what are the some of the bad reads out there. We will show you to avoid them and what are some good reads out there, okay? So all this, of course, you just have to go to uh, Dividend Machine, which we're gonna launch pretty soon. Some of you have been asking us, when are we gonna launch Dividend Machines, uh, which has been uh, very popular. You can see the countdown here is actually three days, uh, nine hours, okay? So uh, watch out for our emails. Uh, we have a lot of uh, new bonus and also very good price discount, okay? Just watch out for our email, okay? So before we end off this, uh, okay, just answer some of the questions here. Okay, I can't answer all of them, so I try to uh, pick some of the questions. Okay, so uh, Chris, uh, Chris Namurthy, you asked a very good question. How does the wheat grow their distributions uh, when they are ninety percent of their income are actually being paid out. Okay, so this is a very good question. Okay, in fact, this is something which uh, I like to talk about because uh, REITs, not just in Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, I think even in Asia and the US, the way they grow their distribution per unit, even though they pay out ninety percent of them, is actually by adding value to the property that they are managing. Okay, so sometimes you know they have uh, this strategy called asset enhancement initiative, where they can actually look into the existing property and then they see and they try to find out where are the inefficiencies. Okay, so when they find out the inefficiency in uh, buildings and empty space where they can actually convert into a working space where they can list out the new tenants, they can convert this empty space into a rental uh, cash renting uh, area. Okay, so this is what we call asset enhancement initiative. Okay, so this is what the risk managers do full time, they have to figure out how to actually continue to add value just from the existing value of the property. Okay, so sometimes they can upgrade, they can tear down the building and then they redevelop into a bigger unit, bigger buildings, and this out at a higher uh, rental per square foot. Okay, so like for example, Capital Land Commercial Trust, they actually tear down Golden Shoes Car Park and they are going to redevelop into a new office building, grade A, which they can charge much higher rent okay so when they convert this successfully they can list out at a better price okay so that's where they can afford to pay uh, more dividends so, so asset announcement initiative is just one way uh, a second way is of course doing a uh, yield equitative acquisitions where they will have to issue either placement or borrow money from the bank or uh, generally these are the two ways that they raise the cash and then they will buy uh, properties that are undervalued okay basically the property you are higher than the existing property where when they acquire this property they will improve the distribution per unit okay so these are some of the reads a manager does on a day-to-day -day basis they have to make sure the dp uh, distribution per unit grow over the time some reads manager just don't care okay so you avoid those uh, reads managers at all okay all right so um quite thirsty actually Okay, so um, few more questions to go. 
how many reads should we hold at any one time okay there is no limits to how many reads that you can hold you can buy all the reads if you want but, but generally i only invest in uh, one or two reads in that one sector and the best reads okay um so like for example healthcare reads i will only invest in one healthcare reads in let's say there are two healthcare reads so among between parkway and uh, first reads uh, I'm talking about back then, the Parkway valuation was slightly expensive, but I'm willing to take uh, to take on this uh, quality of assets because it's very stable. So I only stick to one. Okay, so one sector, preferably one. The most you can go is, of course, two. Uh, try to diversify across uh, different sectors. So by that, by doing that, I think you are going to have, I think, uh, five reads at least in your portfolio. And make sure that those, this, all these reads does not take more than a, uh, fifty percent of your total portfolio. Okay, if you are looking merely from the income point of view. Okay, some of you are still young. You can invest in a cool stock. Okay, those that don't pay a lot of dividends. But of course, today we are talking about dividends. Uh, okay. So, okay. So, uh, what is the dividend percentage we should be still be in for? Okay, Tershom asks, what is the dividend percentage you? Okay, we should recently aim for. Uh, I don't think there's an aim or, or target that you need to look at, but uh, I'm not sure which questions or where you are actually heading into, but I assume that you are referring to uh, what are the you that is considered attractive before you buy into REITs. Again, uh, different type of REITs in different sectors trade at a different yield. In the REITs, of course, they are because of their land leases are shorter, and the depreciation, depreciation are much higher. That's why they can give a higher uh, distribution yield. Okay, and the risk also higher uh, because the rental for industrial actually fluctuate up and down. Okay, whereas for healthcare, on the other end, can be very, very steady. The yield can be about 4%. Industrial can give you about 8%. Okay, so it's give and take, all right? So it depends on the risk appetite. I prefer to go for quality rather than highest uh, distribution yield. Okay, Richard. Okay, Richard. Uh, this is Cambridge where you have read just now. I already bring it up. You actually spotted forty eight percent, right? So top max is forty five percent. Of course, uh, again, this is just our own methodology of calculations, the gearing. But because of the perpetual securities, the they can manage to uh, escape this gearing ratio. Okay, this I already brought out this, so you just have to be careful. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Baguhan, uh, you mentioned that Ascenders Industrial Trust is not listed in the read data, and the reason is because at this Ascenders reads, Ascenders in the India Trust is not a read, it's a business trust. Okay, there's a big difference between business trust and the read. The reads generally are regulated by MS, where their gearing cannot exceed 45%. Uh, and not more than, uh, I think, 90% uh, of the assets uh, have to be restricted within the property area and they have to pay out 90% of the distributable income, okay? Whereas for business trust, they don't have such regulations. A lot of the regulations are self-imposed, meaning to say that the, the people who are running the business trust actually impose these rules on themselves, but they are not uh, uh, liable for that, okay? So uh, I don't consider them as a REIT. I still prefer uh, REITs in general because uh, regulations are in place and uh, it is the risks are much lower. Okay, I'm just going to go through the last questions here before we end off this. Okay, as someone starting to invest in REITs, what do you recommend uh, reading up before investing? Any particular websites to recommend? Thank you for uh, sharing. Okay, so uh, Ching Yi asks, you know, uh, Ching Yi is someone who is new to uh, investing in REITs. Okay, what do you do? I recommend uh, reading up uh, before investing in REITs. Of course, you can come to Dividend Machines uh, uh, courses, which we're going to launch in three days' times. Other than that, you can go to our free resources, where fifthperson.com, where we can actually write a lot of our uh, REITs, um, and you can go through and start with them. Start start from there, and sometimes we also uh, attend live uh, AGMs. Uh, of, of the REITs that actually hold in uh, Singapore, Malaysia, 
or even Hong Kong. Okay, so through this AGM, you get to learn a lot of insights on how to uh, analyze tweets. In this kind of AGM's content, you don't get it, you can't get it over the book. Okay, no one really cover it. And that's why we just decided to cover this uh, findings. And also you see, we have some of the trainings, you can actually go through them. Uh, okay, these are some of the free resources that you have. Okay, there are books that are available which you can read. Um, but generally, um, well, we can just start all these are actually free. Okay, so once you're ready, you can always join us at the real machines. Uh, bookshop, okay. So, uh, Francis, okay, last, last questions. Francis, Francis asked, would you look at overseas uh, wheat? Yes, of course we will. We, in fact, we look at Malaysia wheat and Hong Kong wheat. Um, actively monitor Malaysia wheat because some of the wheats are coming down quite aggressively. Uh, Capital M Malaysia Motor is one of them. Uh, even in the Hong Kong, we also look at some of the wheats like, you know, Ling wheats, which we trace money uh track very carefully but of course we have to wait for the good valuation before we enter into those uh reads, okay so yes we do invest in uh overseas reads as long as there's an opportunity for us to make money uh, i don't think we should limit ourselves within singapore or malaysia okay if you are investing in those from those countries we should always look uh, beyond our own country if there are good opportunities for us to make money we can definitely go over there and deploy our capital okay so uh with that i think i'm just going to end off this uh, live webinar again this is not going to be um the last the last webinar we're going to have we, next month we're going to have our webinar again so just uh, tune in make sure you actually tune into our live webinar and before i end this off i just want to wish everyone a very happy chinese new year and may the year of dog be you uh, good wealth, health, and happiness. Okay, and thank you so much for uh, tuning in.